Okay. The room is getting populated very quickly. Cool. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. We're giving some folks at some time. We're going to welcome you this afternoon Maybe to this panel discussion on women on mobility in the city. Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's start in a few seconds, three, two, one. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening to our guests in Europe. Good afternoon to our, fo for our folks in the East Coast. Bon dia. Good afternoon. Hello to everybody. My name is Kazim Balagoon. I am a project manager with the Rosa Luxemburg New York office. I want to welcome you this afternoon, this evening, to a virtual panel discussion seminar on women and mobility in the city that is being co hosted by our offices in Sao Paulo and Brussels. Um, this panel discussion is a kickoff of a series looking at the issues around mobility justice. Uh, we'll be having another uh, round of uh, conversations on March 25th on race in the city and another one on uh, April 22nd on free public transportation at all. Want to give a deep level of thanks to the project managers out of San Paulo, uh, Daniel Santini, and also the project managers out of the Brussels office, Manuela Krupp, for their wonderful support this afternoon. Um, uh, I will just want to just really quickly before we get started with today's seminar, just kind of set the room. Um, this seminar will, is um, being broadcast um, in multiple languages um, and we want to make it accessible. So if you can, if you, if you wish to listen to the broadcast in Portuguese, um, you can click on the interpretation button that's on the right hand side of your at the bottom of your zoom screen is a small globe and choose the option for Portuguese and for our and when we have our Portuguese speakers present um, I will ask the English language speakers to click on the interpretation button which is the small globe on the bottom of the screen and click on the word English to be able to hear our interpretation and we want to uh, also thank the interpretation that's being provided by to us this afternoon by translingua uh, interpreters. Um, thank you, Teresa, and to thank you for Timothy. Um, I will kick it over to Danielle, who will explain this in Portuguese. Muito obrigado, Kazemi. Meu nome é Daniel Santini, sou coordenador de projetos da oficina de São Paulo. É um evento conjunto, a gente está organizando. I don't believe I need to do this because you heard it, but I'll do it just so you can hear in English. It's, so this is uh, co-hosted by Brazil, Brussels, and New York. Anyone who wants to listen in Portuguese, please select the globe at the bottom of your screen where you see interpretation. Choose English if you need to hear in English or Portuguese if you want to listen in Portuguese. And you can also mute the original audio, which allows you to mute the, the background sound that you'll hear if you're listening to interpretation. The options today are English and Portuguese, and I would like to thank for the partnerships. It's very good to work collectively and together at the international level. So thank you, Kazembi. Obrigado. Abrogado. Um, we are, this is again, an international effort between the offices of Sao Paulo, Brussels and New York. And to give a brief introduction and welcome, oh, I'd like to welcome to you on stage right now, the director of the New York office, the executive director of the New York office, uh, Mr. Andreas Gunter. Andreas, good afternoon. Hello, uh, hello everybody. And thank you, Kazemba, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm glad to welcome you all for this uh, first uh, event of a series on uh, public transport and uh, mobility in the city. Um, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, uh, for those uh, of our attendees who do not know so good, the organization so good, is a progressive uh, think tank, an uh, NGO, 
that is working on uh, civic education and especially dedicated to fostering the ideas of uh, social justice and democracy, amongst others. Um, we, the New York office, uh, and uh, as it was already mentioned, this is a cooperation between uh, the office of New York, Sao Paulo and Brussels, about what I'm uh, so especially happy today. Uh, the New York office has been working for uh, on uh, the right to the city uh, for many years now. An important part of that is uh, tra public transport and mobility accessible mobility in the city. Um, and you cannot think the problem of uh, public transport and mobility uh, without thinking the question of women and public of, and of women and mobility. It is uh, and uh, women are especially uh, concerned by this issue on in many ways, uh, be it uh, as uh, still the uh, predominant care workers very much involved in uh, service business uh, working at unusual times uh, and still also the tradition that uh, the maybe uh, yeah that that they have to do special things and are much more uh, on their ways in the public transport and still if you uh, access uh, New York subway uh, coach, uh, you will see that uh, that women are the majority in this uh, still. And of course, so the accessibility uh, of uh, public transport of mobility in the city has a lot of economic meanings for women. But of course, it is also a question of participation of democracy. You cannot, um, of course, we have now kind of virtual participation, but you, uh, a lot of participation me is, is connected to coming from one place to the other and being uh, present, present at places. And that is not possible, possible without access to mobility. So that there are just some thoughts from my side, of course. Uh, we have invited uh, panelists that cannot can explain, who can explain that much better than I can. And so I don't want to uh, further delay the interesting discussion that we will, that we are expecting. And uh, so I kick it back to Kasembe, who will lead us to the following uh, procedures. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Andreas. I appreciate Thank you so much. And I want to introduce today the moderator for the conversation that we're hosting today, um, uh, Professor Norma Ratizzi. Uh, she's a professor of geography at Concordia University. She's the co-chair of the Planners Network. Um, she's also a member of the board of Black Rose Publishing Books, Black Rose Books, in addition to being on the editorial board of Progressive Cities. We're very honored to have you join us today from Montreal. Uh, thank you so much, Norma. Thanks so much, Kazemi. The honor is all mine. Um, greetings uh, to you all from Montreal, which is um, actually, I want to acknowledge the unceded lands of the Gunungahagi Nation, uh, Jojake, uh, as the name goes. And I'm really excited and privileged to be moderating this discussion on mobility of women and non-binary people. Um, I, apart from being a professor of geography, I actually teach urban planning as well within the department and many of the themes that revolve around these issues have to do with urban planning um, or planning more generally conceived. I think today the pandemic and restrict, heightened restrictions on mobility have accentuated and made ever more evident the ongoing structural injustices uh, for safe, in regards to safe and accessible streets and different modes of transport provision. Planning has long centered the hetero white upper to middle class male in the design of infrastructure in ways that continuously marginalize and place 
at risk women and bi non-binary people, and most significantly BIPOC women, disabled women, elderly women with children, pregnant women. There's um, been a historic emphasis on technical solutions without delving deeply into the social and political factors that underpin planning orientations and priorities of government and transit agencies. As um, Andreas had already mentioned, there's also um, really overlooking of the social production, reproduction activities that women disproportionately shoulder. Um, and in addition, um, although there tends to be emphasis on commuting trips in transit planning, the commuting trips of essential service workers who are disproportionately women of color are not really centered in these considerations, not in terms of affordability or access, nor are our systems designed to ensure easily accessible safe paths and safety uh, for women or non-gender, non sorry, conforming people. So our panelists today will be speaking about the need for change in policy in order to ensure more equitable forms of mobility to push us to think about how to plan differently in ways that center the agency and the vision of those who've been most marginalized from planning our collective streets and transport infrastructure and the more creative and artistic ways to lay claim to movement in and through space. And now I would like to introduce our panel of distinguished international activists, artists, and researchers who will be speaking on this vitally important theme. Um, and I will be introducing them in the order in which they will be speaking. I'll start first with Angie Schmidt, who is one of the country's best known writers on the topic of sustainable transportation. She was longtime national editor of Street Blog, Streets Blog. Uh, her writing and commentary have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and NPR. She's founder of a new firm, 3P, 3MPH, and you'll correct me if I got that wrong, right. Planning and Consulting, which is a small Cleveland-based firm that focuses on pedestrian safety. And quite recently, uh, in last August, she's published her book, Right of Way, Race, Class, and the Silent Epidemic of Pedestrian Deaths in America, published by Island Press. And after Angie, we'll be hearing from our featured Portuguese speaker, Nian Cunha, woman, Black, Amerindian, and transgender, is one of the most recognized voices in the deep pathologi pathologization of trans identities in Brazil, and the first trans woman to announce, to denounce, sorry, uh, violence in the Organization of American States. She integrates several initiatives and spaces as an independent activist. Um, among them, the March of Black Women of Sao Paulo, and as a patron of Casa Neon Cunha, an LGBTQI uh, welcoming space in ABC Polista. And then after Neon, we have Alexandra Milanik, a researcher with the Australian Institute of Technology. She's been conducting research on mobility behavior and mobility data collection. She works on the topic of gender and mobility and can explain how our transport systems and transport infrastructure need to change in order to meet mobility requirements of women. And after Alexander, finally, we'll have Ebony Noel Golden, who's an artist, scholar, and culture strategist from Houston, Texas, but currently based in Harlem. She devises site-specific ceremonies, live art installations, creative collaborations, and arts experiments that explore and radically reimagine um, viable strategies for collective Black liberation. In 2009, Ebony founded Betty's Daughter Arts Collective Collaborative, sorry, a culture con consultancy and arts accelerator that devises systems, strategies, and solutions for and with education, arts, culture, and community groups globally. Um, our 
So I'm going to now uh, first, hand, before I guess I hand it over to Andrea, I just, in terms of just some housekeeping matters, um, we definitely want to encourage Q&A, question and answer period, and we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A um, rather than in the chat. Um, and we need to be mindful that we do have uh, translation going on, uh, although I, I don't know that I was as mindful as I should have been, which means speaking, uh, enunciating and speaking a little more maybe slowly than we might normally speak. Um, and just a reminder that there is a globe to the bottom right of your screen where you can select the interpretation channel for English. Okay, so we will start um, with Angie then, and our speakers will be speaking each for roughly 10 minutes. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, um, I have a couple slides I wanted to share, just, just a few images. So I'm just going to pull that up real quickly. Um, you know, my background is a writer and it's focused on um, the United States context. So I think a lot of the things I wanted to mention have already been touched on, ways that women have been disadvantaged in the um, transportation system in the United States and how that makes their lives more difficult and puts them at risk. So um, one of the key ways, which again has already been touched on is um, very little effort in the United States is put into sort of accommodating people traveling with children, which obviously is primarily women, young children in the United States. And this is an example, um, I pulled this from a Washington Post article that was about a woman who had just given birth to a child and um, the baby was just turned three months and she was venturing out of the house for one of the first times after giving birth. And she loaded up her stroller and walked up to the bus um, system in Washington DC, one of our largest cities and was refused entry to the bus because a lot of United States transit systems do not allow women to have open strollers in buses. Buses have not been designed to accommodate that, to, to accommodate uh, women with young children. Um, and uh, usually they're, they have to share a space that's reserved for people with wheelchairs. So um, women with strollers are sort of competing with um, disabled people for that space. So I, I know that in Europe um, they have uh, bus designs that are much more accommodating to um, people with children, but that's just one example of some of the ways uh, the transportation of children is neglected and falls disproportionately on women. Um, women also face uh, special safety concerns. I should say women and um, non-binary people. Um, and they, uh, they face a lot of these concerns on transit. Uh, this, is, um, this chart here on the left is from a study that was conducted in Los Angeles about sexual harassment on transit. Um, you can see actually um, non-binary folks had some of the highest risk, but again, this is a, this is a major concern uh, for women as well. Um, so much so that the, there was, there's some research out of Los Angeles showing that um, when a new light rail system was added, people from, women from the neighborhood were half as likely to take advantage as men were primarily due to fears about crime. Um, and, and this is, again, this is something that is um, a big problem that is uh, present in every transit system in the United States and is a well-known problem and is, uh, we know impacts behavior quite a bit and discourages women who are the primary transit riders in the United States who make up the majority of transit ridership from riding. Um, and yet it's um, barely been addressed by our transit agencies. Only a handful in the United States have addressed this in any way. There are some, um, I know in other nations, uh, for example, in some Asian countries, there are special train cars for women, but um, that kind of thing is almost unheard of in the United States. Um, the Canada also, I know, has implemented some interesting responses to that. So uh, a little bit, I, I'm just sort of uh, sort of listing some of, some of the barriers. A question of algumas das barreiras. So 
Another big issue is um, has to do with housing in the United States. Um, this is a you know this chart shows the percentage of housing um, in these major U.S. cities that is single family housing. Uh, in the United States, we have a zoning code that um, encourages. Uh, like for example, here on the right shows all the lands in yellow that is reserved for single family houses only in the city of Seattle. So as you can see, a major city, almost all the land area is reserved only for single family houses. And I, this, is a, this really goes back to some sort of patriarchal heteronormative um, history we have in the United States dating back to the 1950 and the suburban era where we've, we've basically outlawed building um, different housing types, including apartments in large swaths of all of our cities and uh, some suburbs will uh, entirely exclude uh, multifamily housing. So this, uh, why do I bring this up? I mean, you know, obviously housing and transportation are very closely related. Um, and th these uh, prohibitions on apartment buildings, um, they increase the price of housing and they may put it out of reach for uh, women, especially women who are single. Um, and they increase the price of housing and also, um, Single family houses can increase domestic labor, so it puts additional domestic burdens potentially on women compared to uh, shared housing facilities. Um, okay, so moving along, we also have this issue in the United States um, where our vehicles have become increasingly uh, large and terrifying, especially in the last few years, sort of in the Trump era. And this is an image I use in a lot of my presentations. It shows here, this, this is my son when he was four years old, standing in front of, this is a, a lifted Ford F-250. Um, the slightly smaller version though of this, this truck, the Ford F-150, is the number one selling vehicle in America and um, has been for a long time. And you can see, um, how this vehicle has a very, very large forward blind zone. Um, there's, there's groups that have done pre, uh, different experiments where they're able to sit as many as 30 children in, in the forward blind zone of a truck like this, and they're totally invisible. So th I, this, um, to navigate children through an environment um, that is dominated by these kind of vehicles requires a degree of vigilance from parents. And again, because the parenting responsibilities fall primarily on mothers, um, that is just really intense. And um, when children are injured or killed in traffic crashes, when they're playing outside in the United States, um, generally the response is to just to sort of blame the parents. Um, so rather than put the responsibility for keeping children safe on drivers and imposing rules on automakers that would create a safer environment, we've chosen to put that burden sort of on families. And it, it's having, um, I, I just, um, there's a new study out that's very interesting I, run, I wanted to mention um, by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. And they found that this is actually because of the, we've seen this huge prol proliferation of large SUVs and pickup trucks over the last decade in the United States, it's been very profitable for automakers, but it comes with um, some really negative safety effects, especially for people who are pedestrians. But um, this new study found that um, very sadly, women are more likely to be injured or killed in a car crash than men, even though they um, crash less, they crash their cars less and they take less risks. The reason for that is because they're, they're driving smaller vehicles compared to, um, you know, the marketing of these kind of vehicles is very much geared towards men. This is the masculine vehicle to drive. And when men driving these kind of cars crash, which they do more than women, um, they injure women driving smaller cars. So I, I just think that's really disturbing. Um, finally, and lastly, and this was touched on earlier, uh, our, our transportation engineering and planning system is focused almost entirely on easing car commutes. Um, and this is an example of, we, we, we have a, more and more of these giant interchanges in the United States. You know, these things, they, it's not unusual now 
for interchanges of this scale to cost a billion dollars to upgrade and fix. So we, we see that in all of our ma major metros almost now, even smaller places like Milwaukee have multiple billion dollar interchanges and, and the, so much effort and expense goes into creating this. These kind of facilities that are aimed at maybe they shave a few minutes off a long distance car commute from the suburbs that happens, you know, in the typical nine to five hours. And, and I think, um, meanwhile, we have, I, I asked someone recently, or I reached out to my network, does anyone know of any transportation agencies that are studying caregiving trips? Um, what do those look like? How can we help facilitate them? And the, the response was basically no, 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 um, transportation planning agencies in the United States are looking at that and working to facilitate it outside of, we do have one program called Safe Routes to School, which is a line item in our federal budget um, that ends up being tens of millions of dollars compared to a $50 billion annual surface transportation budget. So like someone mentioned earlier, I, I do 100% agree that um, transportation planning and engineering has really been focused on who is thought of as the typical or important commuter or traveler. And that is sort of thought of in everyone's head as you know, a, a man, probably a white man at middle age who commutes in a car from the suburbs to the city. And I think it, 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 it causes a lot of problems, not just for women, but for other people who fall outside of that sort of persona, um, people with disabilities, their needs are being overlooked. Again, women, women with children, even people who are retired, elderly children are, are all are not very well served by this dynamic. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to our next um, guest. Great, thank you, Angie. You were perfectly on 10 minute time period too. Um, so we have next our featured Portuguese speaker, Neon Cunha, and I'll turn it over to you. And just a reminder about translation is available at the interpretation button to the bottom right. Thank you. Olá a todas as pessoas. Hello everyone from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, specifically to a region of Brazil called Sao Paulo, which is part of a large uh, state. It's a large city. I will even be more specific. I want to introduce to a new thinking. Uh, about women who leave their spaces of origin to provide to in hope for a better life. Uh, and that should be noted in Brazil because 56% of this population is black women of all different uh, kinds of uh, sexual orientation and gender identities and a uh, very uh, unprivileged social class uh, who are uh, harmed by several kinds of constructs, social constructs. So I need to talk specifically about trans uh, women, the right to the city, to mobility, to enjoy the city needs to be looked at much more broadly. Uh, from a socialist point of view to defend democracy, the right is to exercise democracy by the entire population. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, uh, a process of pretense of defending democracy. Egg Gisberta in the 1990s, a Brazilian woman uh, left Sao Paulo from a neighborhood called Casa Verde to 
uh, live in France, stays very shortly in France and goes to Portugal. Gisberta uh, was a Brazil is a Brazilian who lives from prostitution. She's a trans woman living with HIV, uh, homeless, who uh, ends up in a religious institution for youth in the city of Porto. Gisberta was killed at 42 years of age. She left Brazil to escape extermination of uh, trans uh, women. Lisbeta is executed. She promotes the discussion on gender identity and cultural identity. Thus, she promotes a legislation that understands the specificities and the subjectiveness of this existence. Uh, it's been 15 years since Gisberta's uh, death. Brazil it has the most trans women killed in the world. These women are violated and from their rights. Last year, 175 women died. Uh, and I would say that that number is underestimated. 80% of them are black and living from prostitution. In addition, the average life of these women is 29 years. We don't have precise studies because we don't have information. We are trying to introduce the gender identity and sexual orientation to uh, government official researches and census. On that in introduction of the absence of public policy and more than that, the social welcoming. I wanted to tell you about a case uh, which mirrors so many other cases, which is the death of a young woman, 25 years old, in a uh, clandestine plastic surgery clinic. She's trying to, she went there to get a prosthesis. We're talking about the right to have your body as an expression of yourself. So in that clinic, there is a fire and this woman is abandoned, uh, sedated on a gurney and she died from smoke inhalation at 25 years of age. This became public when her partner in from Recife, people have uh, the, the distance from Recife and Sao Paulo is two and a half days by bus. So this woman came to have this uh, surgery uh, because the prices are better and uh, they have this clinic. Unfortunately, uh, she died. And the, the, a major difficulty was to bring her body back to her family. So there was some politicians tried to help to return her body to her family. Here in, I am the patron uh, of an institution with my name for LGBTQI, who know of my work. And in 2016, the OAS, received a trans woman to talk about violations in, and that happened as late as 2016. There are other factors that are extremely urgent for us to understand and to give attention to. A population that is homeless, 
people who use the downtown areas as a source of income, where to live, and they struggle for access to water, baths, because the shelters are not adequate. So I want you to think of me about the trajectory of a woman, a black woman who left Natal in the northern part, northeastern part of the country, two and a half million kilometers away from Sao Paulo. She comes to Sao Paulo, cannot find uh, jobs and she becomes homeless because there is no public policy. She had been uh, incarcerated. She leaves prison. She does not, cannot find a job. She does not have uh, documentation. And again, recently she became homeless. She's again imprisoned and uh, accused of trafficking, and she lives with uh, HIV. Another 150 days without news, the institution receives news when she goes to a hospital. In the hospital, they tell us that uh, she has pneumonia. The fact is that we don't have statistics about the uh, the progress of uh, COVID-19 in, in prisons. There is no data, no information about what is happening with COVID in the prisons. She died on the 12th. We can only, we were only able to get news about her death and to have her body released to us on the 19th. The release of the body, because the family is so, uh, so far away, uh, becomes the responsibility of our institution. We begin to talk to the government about the need to have the name of that person. They have a social concession in Brazil, which allows them to use their preferred name. At the morgue, uh, we need to educate uh, the persons responsible for releasing bodies so that the uh, death certificate can have the social name so that we may be able to go to a uh, cemetery and request that the name of that woman uh, appears in the official records. This woman, Lurhani, 31 years old, the average life expectancy for a Brazilian citizen is 75 years. And for these women, it is 29 years old. So we ask ourselves, what can we do? Like Lorraine uh, always said, uh, people, they don't offer me anything. They never have anything for me. These people cross uh, entire cities on foot. They are not accepted in public transportation. Any person without proper hygiene, without the proper clothes, is not allowed on mass transit. We are talking about a social exclusion of a social class that does not recognize people's a right to enjoy the city. Many conditions that limited this discussion. Finally, I wanted to mention another case. Uh, again, a homeless woman who lives. Uh, under the name Esther. Again, we're talking about a, a very dark black woman. Esther says that she's going to uh, 
afraid of being in the shelters, of being on the streets. This is a mid 2019. At the end of that year, I met Esther and she told me, it doesn't matter what I do, I need to exist. I need to be recognized as Esther. So fortunately, at the end of uh, the year, during Christmas, we, we had a Christmas celebration. I don't see Esther. And at the end of last year, I found out that she died with 80% of her body charred. Uh, someone burned Esther to death. The family wants the body, but we don't have autonomy uh, or authority to take, uh, to get access to the body because we are not family. And the family is asking whether we are going to, uh, to do our part. Uh, and then the family tells, told us that they are going to bury Esther as a man and not as a woman because they don't recognize non-binary people. So what is urban mobility? It seems to me that with all the, with all the constructs, it has to do with some privilege, either in mobility or the idea, the pretension that people's gender is more legit, legitimate than trans people's identities. So I ask, who is going to provide mass transit in the future? Women uh, have difficulties even finishing uh, high school. So education is precarious. Culture is, is difficult. Again, there is a process of cultural uh, dominance by a certain class of people who manipulate access. And to me, future is only possible if we can discuss democracy from early childhood. I think this is extremely important to talk about uh, the rights of paternity of trans men who reproduce of women and to talk about a broad array of a universe where change will be possible only through education in a name in a country where we have names like Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks and Elia Gonzalez, we go back to a process of education. There is no other way. We need to raise awareness of society, of their, our responsibility for a whole where our lives intersect. We need a process to discuss urban mobility. And part of that process is to discuss which lives are necessary and a democratic and socialist dialogue. Thank you, we are together. Thank you, Nian. And I just wanted to mention that I think one of the things that both of our speakers have highlighted is the real genuine dangers and violence um, that our current systems are really enabling and upholding um, in different ways from land use and transport infrastructure to really the dominant social constructs that our institutions um, prop up and highly discriminatory ways. Um, and as the case of trans black women in Brazil is illustrated. So thank you so much for, uh, for both of your talks really pointing out the, the genuine dangers that we face and, much, and conf must confront at, in different ways. 
Um, and now I want to turn um, the floor or mic over to uh, Alexandra. Thank you very much. Um, turning uh, to to Europe and uh, my my uh, research, I'm doing in the in the area of mobility behavior. Um, I also have a few slides uh, which I would like to share with you. So I hope you can already see them. So just let me know if you can see them. Yes, we can see them. Yes. Excellent. Um, yes, uh, in Europe, the discussion is a lot about uh, inequalities, but also uh, climate change. So uh, we actually, we have uh, several issues to solve here. And uh, what we, uh, what, what I am uh, working on is uh, understanding how mobility behavior is developing, how it's evolving, uh, what different types of behavior there are, and uh, what are the elements of behavior change and how can we support behavior change, especially in the light of, of climate change. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Austrian Institute of Technology. Uh, I have been working uh, in that area for uh, plus uh, 15 plus years. And uh, um, especially when it comes to inequalities, uh, we, we try to really get into uh, the reasons why uh, inequalities develop and uh, so to say to uh, identify uh, the different factors that we can uh, use and we can start to, to change in order to, to change the, the whole setting for mobility of different disadvantaged groups. So what is actually the, the term uh, female mobility aiming at. So what do we mean uh, by female mobility? Um, in, in particular, we want to look at uh, the different influence factors and also uh, find out uh, what is the, the, the size of influence that those different factors have. And uh, Norma already mentioned it, uh, that uh, the, the urban um, development and spatial development has a, has a really large impact, impact on the mobility behavior um, because it's Basically, the, the reason why we have to get out and, and uh, take any means of transport is that uh, our destinations are distant. So not everything that we want to do uh, during a day that we um, want to reach is within walking distance. And so uh, we are more or less forced to use other means of transport to get what we, uh, we want. And it's not such so much a right to be mobile, although there's all, uh, also uh, a certain human need to be out and about. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not just the desire to get out of your home, which we uh, now especially feel during the, the, the corona crisis, but it's uh, really that we don't have anything, uh, everything uh, just in, in the neighborhood and we need to get somewhere else in space, in the physical space uh, to, to uh, yeah, do errands or, or uh, go to work and so on. And the other thing is, uh, what are the tasks that we actually have to do? What are the responsibilities we have? Is it just, uh, do, do we get to uh, only get, have to get to the workspace or uh, do we also need to take care of children or of uh, older relatives, for example? Do we have other obligations? Uh, are we responsible for uh, uh, running all the errands, uh, taking children to, to piano lessons or, uh, or, or other education? So the amount of responsibilities we have also defines the demand uh, on mobility that we have. So, and when we need to get out, um, how do we decide which mode to take, which trip to take? So um, I'm referring here a little bit to, to theory, to social practice theory, which can uh, explain a lot of the, the behavior patterns that we have, and this is very um, easy to understand. And I translated the social practice theory in the mobility areas. And there are mainly three components uh, that we have to um, be aware of when we think of um, 
what makes us choose a specific trip or a specific mode of transport. So the first, of course, uh, everybody knows is access. So if we have uh, a car in your household or you have a, a bus station or a mass transit station, uh, this uh, is, of course, uh, you have a better chance to get a, get around and, and get somewhere else. So uh, basically the physical access to a means of transport or the means of transport uh, provides to you to get to your destination, uh, defines if you can choose a specific mode uh, and also if you can afford it. Um, and uh, not just if you can afford it, but also if you uh, are able to physically use it. So if uh, uh, the access to public transport, for example, is barrier free, if you have space for your stroller, uh, if you have enough room for, for all the groceries you have to carry and so on. So this is uh, going really to uh, define uh, your decision which mode to take, but it's not just the only one, uh, not just the material you need, the infrastructure and the vehicles, it's also, uh, do you know how to use them? Uh, do you have the, um, the, the permission to use them? So do you, do you have a, a pass, for example, for using public transport? Do you have a driver's license? And uh, do you know how to, to deal with it? Have, do you ha did you have training? or is it simple enough to use? So uh, those can pose other barriers to use a specific mode of, uh, mode of transport. And there's a third very important dimension, which is ambition. So how much does it mean to you to choose a, a trip or to do a trip or to choose a specific mode of transport? So that's more the, the emotional level. So while the first two components will define if you can do a trip and if you can, use a specific, a specific mode of transport. The third one is going to define if you want or dare to use this um, mode of transport, for example, or at a specific time of day, for example. So taking together um, these three components uh, and, and, and the two elements I was talking before uh, about, this uh, helps us to understand the sources of inequalities. So. Uh, of course, uh, if you are in a, in a central space where you have access in walkable distance to different shops, for example, to schools, uh, to, to, to parks, to recreation areas, and so on, uh, it is easier for you to, to, to get around then and, and, and do your, your, your daily routines um, uh, than if you are uh, more, more uh, in, in a in a space where you don't have that. So if it is not really a local um, uh, community where you have everything at hand, if you are more on the countryside, for example, or in the suburbs, uh, you need to change your physical position and you probably need to, to have access to a mode of transport. Uh, that's true for, for old people, but when we add the mul multiple responsibilities that uh, you, women uh, especially have, uh, that means that uh, they are more forced to go out and to, to access different, dis, uh, different destinations uh, and it makes it harder for them to, to achieve that within one day more or less. So uh, especially single uh, parent families, uh, mostly of course women, um, they really have the issues uh, to, to make sure that they, they can all have the, the trips that they need uh, to, to do. Uh, in a day um, to, to really uh, not get stress, stressed out. And we know from our studies uh, that especially single um, uh, parent families and women uh, with children, uh, they find it very difficult to, uh, they usually uh, spend more time um, in, in transport and they have uh, uh, less time for each specific trip and uh, they are more or less in a hurry all the time. So this is something that's putting a lot of stress on them and a lot of uh, inequality because they have the, uh, so many responsibilities. Um, then we have the three components. So uh, a source of inequality is, of course, if you if you are not the one who has priority to to uh, to take the car if there's only one car in the family, or uh, who has to face uh, specific barriers if you are not allowed with a, st a stroller. There's not enough space uh, for you. Um, to, to uh, take your children uh, with uh, in, in public transport, or you have financial li limits, uh, so you cannot have a car, a second car you can use for the families, um, in, in the family, or you have 
um, uh, no uh, or, or public transport is, is also too expensive for you. Um, then limited uh, abilities, of course, uh, they can mean that you may not have a training, you don't have experiences to use uh, public transport, so you will uh, not know how to use, uh, which is often the case in Europe, uh, to use a, a ticket machine, for example, they are too, compli too complicated, or uh, the, um, uh, the, the different um, uh, bus lines, uh, metro lines, and so on, it's too, the whole network is too complicated. Uh, which is uh, something my mother has always to deal with when she is coming to visit me in, in Vienna. She would not dare to use the public transport system. Uh, it's too complicated for her. Um, and uh, of course, it has been mentioned already, there are concerns of fear uh, to use public transport, for example. But it's not just that uh, kind of emotional barrier that, that women often face. Uh, it can also be shame uh, and limited self-confidence if you are not sure if if you make mistakes using the system if you uh, and women get uh, they are often told that they have a bad sense of orientation for example they will get lost uh, and women are not worse in orientation and navigating uh, but they believe it and so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy um, and this can also lead to um, uh, women not using a specific mode of transport or uh, not doing a specific trip if they fear uh, to, to make mistakes and, um, and, and be ashamed of it. So that leads to the, the differences in mobility behavior that we see in men and women, for example. Uh, so um, women tend to have more complex uh, trip chains, uh, chains they, they tend to uh, also be more sustainable in their mobility behavior because they, they use public transport, but not necessarily because they are only, they are more um, aware of the environment, but also why they have to use public transport due to um, financial means, due to not having a second car in the family and so on. So if we know now that those are the main aspects that we need to take into account uh, what the main sources for inequality. So what are the chan chances for mitigating inequality? Uh, of course, uh, growing distances and segregated land use, that's a long-term issue that we have to deal with. So uh, there's also a change in, in spatial planning paradigms required. Um, it's uh, more in, in the direction of 15-minute cities. Um, more public transport and so on. That takes time, of course, but uh, women are now in the situation that they need support. So um, that's that's something that we need to work on, but it's not a, an immediate relief if we work on that. In terms of multiple responsibilities, um, this needs a change in societal values of unpaid uh, domestic work, for example. Um, so this is also something that is um, maybe even longer term that, that we need to achieve a societal change uh, in the roles, in the gender roles, uh, and in the value we, we attribute to the gender roles. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to achieve and probably nothing that we can uh, solve uh, primarily with the, the transport system, changing the transport system. Limited success is, is something that uh, is actually really de dealt with. Uh, there, there are best practices in Europe. There are uh, many different approaches to do that, uh, especially also barrier-free access or specific discounts. Uh, so there's something that we can al already work with. We can use these be uh, best practices and, uh, and make sure that they are established some, uh, in, in other places as well um, and, and make it easier to have access to public transport, for example. When it comes to limited abilities uh, and or, or, uh, if, if a system is too complex, which is often the case for public transport, um, it is a little bit more tricky. Uh, it, uh, some of the services need to be simplified also when it comes to, to sharing schemes, for example. And uh, also, um, there are some initiatives uh, helping, for example, migrant women uh, from uh, from the Middle East to to learn uh, cycling uh, in the city because they are not allowed to do that, uh, but they get the training and so they use that uh, as a little bit more freedom um, to to get around in the cities. So um, when it 
the, the um, complexity and the ability is also connected then to shame and, and uh, limited self-confidence. And so um, we think uh, that this is not really addressed that much. So there are not that many concepts how to deal with that. Uh, there are concepts to, to deal with safety and security um, uh, issues, uh, but uh, really get, um, getting women more uh, self-confident uh, and, um, and, and easing the emotional barriers is really uh, very difficult and actually we need to, to do more work on that. And there's also an issue I wanted to raise uh, concerning if we make it more easy to use public transport, for example, with children and doing errands and so on. So if you make it more easy for women to, uh, to be in their role, we might also, um, it, it might be a trap because in that case, uh, we may also uh, cause that women will, will continue to be responsible for these, uh, these issues. So um, the other hand, if we, if we want to have uh, women in the same roles as men, so they, that they also have the same big cars and so on, this is, this, um, in, in, with regard to, to climate change, that's also not a good solution. So to, to finish uh, my contribution today, I would invite you to a, a little thought experiment, a project that, that we have been working on and continue to work on. Uh, imagine that, um, uh, with regard to climate change, we, everybody of us is aware of the amounts of emissions uh, they are more or less allowed to emit to reach uh, climate neutrality in 20, 20 years or so. Uh, and that uh, we uh, reduce that amount and we distribute all this, uh, the, the, the allowances uh, in, the, uh, in the population. And those who need more uh, mobility, you need more transport because they have more responsibilities because they are not in, a, in, 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 a, in an urban center. Um, they receive more allowances than those who, who have uh, lesser trips and have lesser responsibilities and have everything in the neighborhood. So that would mean mobility budgets. There's actually a concept we uh, developed in, in a very small uh, project in the recent years and we are just starting uh, a, a transnational project in, in Europe and another national product pro, uh, project where we uh, start testing that. So it's about very much about fair allowances, a fair distribution of allowances uh, regarding spatial uh, situation and social situation, um, which would give people their, um, so they, have, they would have more power to, to understand uh, the consequences of their mobility choices uh, and also to understand the mobility uh, needs that different groups of people have. And on the other hand, uh, the, the uh, authorities on the, on the policy level, uh, they could set measures to, um, to ease the burden of, uh, of those who uh, have really limited allowances and, and find it very hard uh, to, to cope with that. Um, and maybe this would also mean that uh, if, if men uh, see that if you take more responsibilities, you get more mobility allowances, maybe they would, they would uh, be inspired to take more responsibilities in the families. Uh, and we could all follow a sufficiency principle and reduce um, high energy transport uh, and turn to more public transport uh, in an equal way. Um, and let's see if this works out in the project. Uh, I'll share it. I will be glad to share it with you if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, we're going to go into right now a video that Ebony, our final speaker, has shared with us. We're going to start with the video that is being um, set up right now. Get up! Get up! Thank <laughs> you. 
50 years ago, Dr. Barbara Ann Tier changed the language around the people who are performing as a part of this family. Actors know, liberators, yes. Hello, my name is Ebony Noel Golden, and I'm the creator of 125th and Freedom, and also the inaugural directing fellow at the National Black Theater. This 50th season for MBT is a accumulation and a manifestation of the work that's been done for the last 50 years. This moment couldn't be possible without every year being a year about liberation. And for 125th and Freedom to be a part of this, it's beyond my wildest dreams. I'm learning about my capacity me to stretch beyond what I think I know. I am here to use every creative capacity for my people, for our people, for all of the communities that I want this to resonate in. You don't have to be a poet. You don't have to be a dancer. You can be a bus driver. It is all of us on this planet together, in this universe together. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Please let me know if you cannot. I'm gonna take the remaining time that I um, have for my remarks to um, pose a question. Uh, what does it mean to see the city as a liberated black space? The conversation that we're having today is one that I feel like I've been asking myself about in a lot of different ways. I have been asking um, myself this as an artist who um, on purpose has chosen to have a public performance practice in which Black people, all kinds of Black people are taking up public space with the conversation about um, justice, about racial justice, about um, what it means to be free in public. Um, the piece that you just witnessed is uh, from a larger work, as you saw, a five-hour work called 125th in Freedom. And that piece, um, we actually rehearsed in public space. And I uh, learned so much about what it means to be bold and uh, Black and talking about Black liberation in public spaces with people who are artists and people who are not artists. It's something about being um, with the crew of folks who are all there to make art that makes the street, uh, the rhythm of the street feel a, feel a little bit different. It makes um, the rhythm and the pulse of a community more available. I think something that is coming up for me from listening to the other panelists and the colleagues here who are doing this work about what I would say spatial, for me is spatial and environmental justice. Um, you know, 
I, I, I feel very called and very clear about this work being a collective um, movement that it is through coalition building and cultural practice and um, progressive policies, overall cultural organizing um, practices that we can shift the ways in which um, the most vulnerable of us are, are further marginalized as we move about the, uh, the city, um, whether that is on foot, um, uh, in buses and cars or on trains. Our work is a collective movement work, I believe, that requires um, a holistic strategy, arts and culture, transformative justice policies and practices that will um, be rooted in the folk, right? Rooted in the people um, and the, what's best for uh, the majority of us, what's best for the most marginalized and the most oppressed of us. I could go on for a long time and I, I do have a lot of notes here, but I would like to leave you just with some, I'm a poet, so I'll leave you with some snippets and ideas that hopefully um, bring images to mind of ways in which to uh, stay active and stay creative in the pursuit of um, building more justice uh, for folks, for us as we move about our, our cities and our spaces. So some phrases that come to mind are um, our bodies as the first sites of transportation, um, the surrounding environments being complicit in our liberation, borderlands and byways that collaborate with the natural world, with built environments, um, for and to our, our liberation. Thinking about policies that impact the way Black folks are able to move about uh, from police br brutality, the school to prison pipeline, food deserts and food insecurities, overall environmental racism. Even before we think about, even before I think about what happens on a train, a bus or in a car, I'm thinking about stop and frisk. I'm thinking about the type of, of violence that happens when folks walk down the street um, and what that means. Some of the biggest barriers to participation in being culturally mobile, socially mobile, economically mobile, politically mobile um, are not about vehicles, if you will. Um, in my communities, it's about policies. It's about uh, a systemic, an insidious systemic oppression that is ingrained in the founding of this country. I think about, you know, the uh, the initial violences of the transatlantic slave trade and how through that transport um, we get a whole legacy of of extraction and violence and brutality that we are still in, in the United States and perhaps in other countries unwilling to deal with. Um, and so I am advocating for um, a politic, a poetic uh, of public space that is rooted in black feminism, that's rooted in womanism, that's rooted in um, the power, the, the land movement that is the power of the people to steward the land and steward the way we uh, move about the land, one that is harmonious, one that is um, supportive to the well being of the most of us um, and those that are most marginalized. And I'm advocating for um, public performance art to be a strategy and a practice that isn't just about the show, but also about um, a strategy that, that, that can be enacted in many iterations and variations to help us to really sense and feel the spirit of what it means to move about, um, to, to move about cities and spaces in a way that is collective, whole, um, held, and, um, and affirming and generative for those, for all of us. So I'll stop there, thank you.
Thank you so much, Ebony. Um, okay, I'm uh, going to cut any reflections I have very short to move directly into the Q&A because we have quite a number of Q&A uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, but I really just wanted to quickly say how much I appreciated all of the talks and the ways in which they're centering the lived experience, they're centering um, kind of historicizing the injustices also that have brought us to where we are today and the need to push back institutionally and to legislate and to move beyond individual solutions and to work collectively and creatively to do so. And so um, moving on to the Q&A, I want to go in the order um, that the questions that were asked and wanted to start with um, a question from Mar Marcia Maria Alves Silva. Uh, the question was asked in Portuguese in the Q&A, but I have a translation. Um, first, um, Marcia Maria starts with that, um, that they're grateful that we bring such an important and necessary discussion and points that we are discussing different situations in each country and that in Brazil, we are talking about a really precarious and expensive system. Um, Marquia Maria mentions that transport consumes 19% of family incomes affecting mostly women and mostly black women. With COVID, the situation has gotten worse and now buses are even more crowded, tickets are more expensive. This is a moment that we're living with structural unemployment and sexist violence. How do the countries represented here deal, are dealing, how are they dealing with public policies to avoid and contain violence against women in public transport? Um, and uh, Murkia Maria also studies this very same subject. Um, does anyone want to, of our panels want to speak to this? Yes, Alexandra? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I have to say that um, we are in a very privileged position here in Austria because we don't have uh, really reason to be afraid as women if we go on public transport. So there's hardly any issues for us to use public transport even in the evening. So um, we also, uh, the, the public transport providers here, they take uh, precautions uh, by uh, also uh, uh, using different uh, technologies to uh, like CCTV and so on, but uh, probably that's not a reason to, to uh, that's, that's not enough to um, uh, make it safer, um, but it, uh, it may cause uh, people to feel safer at least. Uh, the only issue is that because I'm a researcher, we also have a lot of uh, work uh, now regarding uh, automated transport when it comes to automated shuttle, uh, shuttles, for example, buses and so on, uh, that there is uh, a concern that that might also cause uh, additional um, yeah, issues then for, for women uh, using public transport at night because uh, a bus driver, for example, he has not just, he's not just driving the bus, he also has a so social role uh, to make sure that everything is in order um, and uh, that, that, that people are behaving and so on. Um, so that might cause uh, in the future, if we turn to automated uh, vehicles, uh, that might cause a problem. Uh, and this is something that uh, we are currently discussing. But uh, I have to say, uh, I, I, I almost feel ashamed that I, I don't have any experiences how to deal with, with safety issues in, in Vienna because we don't have have them. Oh, security issues. Not, I have to say safety issues there, are, of course. Thank you, Alexander. And and it's hard to hear all the, all the stories. Anyone else wanted to speak to the question? Okay. I, 
I'm feeling um, called to just to lift up the ways in which folks in my communities um, are not reliant on the state for safety in, um, in terms of expectations um, of the, the government to keep us safe. And it, it, I think it has to do a lot with where we are um, in terms of politically in the United States, in terms of the way black folks are um, historically and in this contemporary moment are treated. I'm, I'm, I'm called to, to, uh, to, to talk about um, an organization or an initiative that I know of, I can't call the name of it, which really is about trans women, um, black trans women coming together to figure out how to move around safely at night. It is not safe on the train in New York City for trans um, folks to be, you know, moving about in some cases. And so they've come up with, you know, there have been, there've been a strategies about folks moving together. Again, this collective moving, especially at certain, from certain parts of the city at night, if you, you know, are, are coming home and you are in one of the boroughs outside of your, your um, you know, if you're coming back from a place outside of where you typically live or you typically reside in terms of your social life and you're coming home late at night and you may be dressed differently or you may look differently than what people are typically assume you to look like and you're alone, then you're a target. And so there are multiple initiatives um, that in which trans folks are coming, moving about together. So folks are not alone. Um, and I think that is something that that I would like to spend more time kind of thinking about or what are the ways adjacent to government, you know, that people are moving underground, that people are moving in order to, to um, have a sense of collective care and collective safety, because the reality is for many reasons, all, you know, people can't afford the train. People can't afford the bus. For many reasons, there, there is, um, needs to be a collective strategy adjacent to what the government is offering because in, 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 the, in the United States for certain communities, in, in, in New York City for certain communities, the government is not doing enough and we don't trust that they ever will. So we are coming up with our own systems and strategies for safety and for moving about that don't rely wholly on what the government should be doing. Thank you, Ebony. Um, you know, I'll just jump in a couple examples that I know of internationally that I think are useful. Um, in, in Canada and some other nations, they use this idea of a night stop on transit. So um, uh, if a, a woman or they've expanded it to anyone can request this, if they're on a bus late at night, they can go to the driver and request. They want to have a special stop that's not at one of the scheduled stops, so in between stops, and they want to be the only one that gets to go off there. So it's a way for them, with the help of the bus driver, to sort of remove themselves from a situation that might be dangerous. There are also groups in the United States that are um, taking on the police presence in transit and the issue that raises, um, especially for people of color. Um, uh, there's, there's proposals, for example, I think in um, Seattle and Los Angeles to be replacing some of these armed police officers with um, more, uh, with unarmed, uh super i don't know the right term sorry um with with unarmed personnel that could intervene um more peacefully because so many of these incidents do escalate into violent confronta confrontations sometimes there's also a good example from sweden that i i like that um Sweden has changed the way apparently they manage snow clearance in order to um, better facilitate women's mobility. They looked at it from a gender perspective, a gender equity perspective, and they found out that women were making shorter trips more often on foot, but um, sidewalks were the last things to be cleared in Sweden. So in order to get a better, um, better gender parity, they switch the order they do it in. Now, apparently in Sweden, they clear the sidewalks first 
Um, and then some of the minor roads where some of this um, caregiving trip making takes place. And then finally, the bigger roads that are more important to the commercial businesses that are used more by men. Um, so I think that's kind of a cool example also. Thank you, Angie. And in the case of the Canadian context, the between stop movement uh, or uh, practice that now is in place was really actually the outcome of mobilization, strong mobilization of women to push it to happen, um, which happened in the mid 90s in the case of Montreal. But I want to also uh, let Neon, uh, who had her hand up. Uh, Yes, I will be brief. I will be brief. Some experiences uh, like the uh, unscheduled uh, stops in buses. There's also another experience that uh, women have uh, asked. Women uh, working in public transportation. So I, when I talked recently, I talked to a woman driver as, and I felt more welcomed than uh, if it were, if she were a male uh, driver, perhaps because of uh, when you should encourage uh, young girls to, to explore different uh, professions. For example, I only know two women who are bus mechanics, only two. There are many professions that are predominantly male. A large vehicle mechanic work, for example, uh, by my own experience and from what I hear from other people, when a, a woman uh, driver uh, is much better to, is much easier to deal with because they understand uh, our situation. And also not to, not to mention the need to have women in positions of power. Thank you, Nia. Also, um, sorry. I will move on to the, the next uh, questions uh, from Cobra Fabian. In Germany, the main debate about safety and traffic is the question of maximum speed limits. Is this an issue in the US too? Are maximum speed limitations a federal issue or is it a state issue? Um, so uh, that's one, one question, but there is also a point raised by um, in the, chat by Lena Gades, also from Germany, that there's also an issue of sexual harassment and violence in public transport and public spaces, uh, particularly many women and queer folks do not feel safe using public transit, especially at night or being alone on the street. So um, just wanted to also include that. But on um, this question of uh, the speed limits, Oh, sorry, can you unmute? Yeah. Oh, um, so yeah, we do. Well, actually, uh, in the United States, the pattern has really been in a lot of states to be raising the speed limits. And um, it's sad because we have terrible, um, we sort of have terrible uh, traffic fatality rates compared to a lot of uh, nations in Western Europe and some nations in Asia. Um, so we, we have about 10,000 speeding related deaths every year, according to, to statistics, federal statistics, and that's probably an undercounting. There has been in some cities a movement to lower speed limits. New York City recently lowered its um, default speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25. Portland recently lowered their speed limits to 20 miles per hour. And um, there is a lot of evidence that that has helped lower vehicle speeds in and of itself, just lowering the speed limits. However, there's um, a lot of concerns right now that are very pressing about enforcement um, and traffic stops can be very freighted for um, black folks and some other 
folks of color. So um, it's uh, it, it's it's a really it's a really controversial sort of topic. Thank you. Um, another question coming from Brenda. Oh, I'm sorry, Alexandra. Not just because Lena uh, raised uh, the issue that that people feel unsafe also in Europe, uh, in, in different cities, of course, this is true. Uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, I'd, maybe I just wanted to say that uh, in Vienna, we really have the luxury that uh, there, there is not much need to to be afraid to go out even in the in the nights, so even if uh, and not that well lit area. Um, and uh, I think we also need to be aware of there, there's a difference between objective uh, security and, and subjective security. Um, but uh, I know uh, that uh, it is an issue. Uh, I was just shocked to, to hear uh, about all these stories and um, just felt lucky uh, where I am. Maybe I wanted to share that. Uh, please forgive me. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, we have also a question um, from Brenda Alves about um, whether there are analytics indicators about trans women in public transportation. If anyone has um, any statistics on that in their respective places. Okay, um, and if not, maybe Nian? Like Nian, yeah. Um, felizmente, não tem nenhuma estatística. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any specific statistic to share with you. Absolutely none in Brazil. All documentation uh, that came out now, one research from Sao Paulo, uh, about uh, some cities and trans people, but very directed to people that uh, use the, some uh, uh, public services. We don't have any information. Even the statistics that we do have, the more painful one about the deaths that I mentioned in my story that are a greater burden every day because we have uh, reports of a woman uh, with a hate crime, 13 year old. Unfortunately, do, we do not have any information on, on this regard. There's even a sentence from a great Brazilian think, thinker, Asoli Carteiro, which is that we are on our own, that we have a topic of black women that say quilombasi, that it's called, like Ebony mentioned, we start closing ourselves within groups and to coordinate collective movements. But I ask myself all the time, when there's no collective group, what do I do with my individual existence? What do I do? We should have a notion of a state or of a society, uh, in specific, specifically in Brazil in this, in my case, where uh, there's integrity of uh, that the human person should be a priority independently of the uh, categor categories or dehumanizations. So we have to remember that the human rights declaration or any other instrument says that uh, the possibility of the existence of a life should be enough and this uh, should be both in reproductive health uh, or any kind of human being this should be the thought prevalent but unfortunately we do not have this data i wrote to luxembourg uh, rosa luxembourg foundation here in brazil what uh, this uh, this nexus between the public transportation so we can rethink and discuss that this is a right of existence as humanity when people talk about this issue uh, of queer people people that do not fall within norms so the question is always be resilient have the strength to be the change so in don't really know if tomorrow I can go out walking and never came come back. So this is the perspect perspective that we need to start thinking. It is urgent for any population, but in particular to the black population, there's an urgent need to assure that we can 
always come back home safely with uh, with without any injury or any uh, anything bad happening to us because uh, homeless people say this a lot that we go through this process but i will never forget that i was denied the access to a bus or a, or a subway or a public space we can solve this situation but the eff effective and emotional health will be present and this is uh, what do we do then with our effective and emotional health with the people that are deprived of all these rights thank you thank you um, the next question we have is from Aline Carolina, who's asking about how we could defend the right to the city in a democratic way when each day more and more private companies are managing transport in cities. Um, Aline Carolina mentions Uber as an example, um, like Salvador in Baha'i State, the company doesn't um, actually service or attend to women who live far away where there aren't bus stops. So I think this is really speaking to what we're seeing in terms of a privatization of access. Did anyone want to speak to this? Yeah, an Uber is often, their vehicles aren't accessible to people with disabilities, and also they don't provide um, child uh, child seats. So I, you know, I know a woman who's blind who, um, up for blind folks, uh, at least access to Uber and Lyft um, can be really liberating. But because she has a young child, the service is just not available to her, and that's um, at least safely. And that's one of the problems with having a, a private company. Because um, you know, if those services are public, we uh, people can insist on ADA um, requirements and that type of thing, and that that's kind of falling under the radar. In that, Alexandra, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I think as mobility is is really in need because you don't have uh, in many cases you don't have to, you don't have the chance to do. Uh, everything in, in walking distance, so you need to get somewhere else, uh, and it, it should be a right to, to uh, have mobility and should be a, a public uh, service in this regard. And we, we have uh, had a lot of discussions in this, um, in this regard, and uh, there has also been discussed that uh, cities, for example, they could set rules uh, for, for uh, private transport providers, uh, they have to, uh, they have to uh, obey uh, to to be allowed to to offer their services there. Um, we see, we also see, see that uh, with Uber, for example, in Vienna, because uh, they are uh, they they have to obey uh, some regulations and rules uh, to not be privileged against uh, taxi drivers, for example. Uh, for example, uh, but this also requires uh, cities to know actually uh, what are the needs of of the population and. Uh, what are the, the, the gaps that, that, that private providers can, can fill. And if they can fill some of the gaps, uh, they should be invited, but uh, obey specific rules to, to add to the mobility system, the public mobility system, and not to, uh, to uh, yeah, pose more, more problems. Thank you, Alexandra. The next question has to do with the mobility budget that you introduced. Um, and asking if it's independent from mode of transport. Do bike trips or walks count as well? Is 100 kilometers on a train the same then as a trip by car, for instance, or is that factored in? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I didn't uh, make that clear enough. No, uh, the idea really is to have um, um, to to so that that uh, a mode of transport would cost uh, the uh, the amount of CO two it is emitting and this takes also into account the production uh, and disposal uh, of of vehicles and vehicle components 
so really the whole life cycle of a vehicle, for example. So uh, for walking and cycling, it's it's almost uh, there's uh, almost unlimited use of that. Uh, and and the more energy and the more CO2 uh, is uh, is related to a mode of transport, uh, the more expensive it would get. So if you have a a budget of a certain amount of allowances, you would have to um, yeah to to consider if if you really need to take a car for a specific trip or if you rather take public transport because it is cheaper in a sense. Um, and so I, I can also provide a link to uh, a yeah, project description and there's also a self-assessment tool uh, where, you, where you can test your own mobility behavior uh, and see how this would fit to um, yeah, um, CO2 reduction goals for Austria because it was an Austrian uh, project. Uh, maybe that's, that's interesting for some, so I can post the link uh, in, in the chat. Thanks, Alexander. That would be helpful. Nia, did you want to respond maybe to the last question, the previous? No, anterior, na verdade. It's really the previous one when somebody talks about Brazil. We can mention several places in Brazil or several situations. We have to talk about social race. Brazil is has a lot of inequality. COVID-19 brought this to bear in, much, in a much more visceral and strong way. So the COVID has to be handled as a post-war process because it brought inequality to another dimension in Brazil. For instance, Uber here, uh, like other uh, application uh, uh, transportation uh, risk areas. So they, they don't go to peripheries because they say it's a risk area for the driver. So they don't serve certain regions. And of course, Uber is a company with an with American DNA, with a, a exploitation, with profit over profit, that will not take any of these factors into consideration. We do not have solutions. We have seen a country that is moving increasingly forward in uh, the outsourcing of services, in other words, privatization. The country is selling everything. So we are discussing now what can we sell? Like for instance, our main oil company called Petrogras, for instance, the cooking gas is increasing in price again. So we're increasing again fees within a pandemic. So in Sao Paulo, we go into a pandemic and they remove access, uh, free access to public transportation to anyone above 60 years of age like a person, Anna Cardoni, that one says that one of the solutions could be bicycles. Yes, bicycles. But what you forget is that how much bicycles are robbed in Brazil. That's a high rate of bicycle robbery. So we have to think of the entire construct uh, that it means to use a bicycle as a transportation means. They steal them. So they steal them where you park them. You don't have anywhere to park them. You have N situations. So it all depends of where you live. It's all very precarious. So this is a debate that will only result in a consistent change if it comes from the a demand from this a more conscious and demanding social society because we for instance like the united states just uh, moved away from the government like donald trump's government and we still have a bolsonaro government who has no interest in considering these questions to have a so we have to have a higher response from the social society because we have two more years with uh, in which we have no one to dialogue with so we need to create a positive and progressive perspective that uh, for which we cannot find uh, foundations because a great number of Brazilians elected Bolsonaro. So we have to deal with this 
uh, consciousness, this dimension, still having an, a huge number in the population that do not even have access to mobility instruments that should be promoted by the state itself, like the conferences in local places, community spaces, to bring this uniformity and the collective. This doesn't even exist because all funds were taken away because uh, there are no more funds allocated to the promotion of public policies and, and awareness raising. So in Brazil, anyone who is aware of these things should propagate this information. Because for instance, digital inclusion does not reach all in Brazil. Despite the fact that many people do have access, many are left outside of it due to not having internet or do not having the not having the devices. If you ask who they are, they are the people who live in the suburbs. Who are the women, people who live in the suburbs? Women. While men are working, they are there with the children. They're usually black women. Black women. There are that often, while we're discussing this, are cleaning the houses of other women. Because in the pandemic, so you can have just an idea of what this is about, many people that could contract people to do, uh, contract people to clean their houses decided to contract the double amount of people for the same salary. So they are actually earning half. So, so just many times the transportation cost is much above what these women get for their work. Thank you, Mia. And we have a question from Kazembe, one of the organizers. So I'm going to give it over to Kazembe. Yeah, this has been really great. I have actually a question for, I guess it's aimed more also to uh, Angie and also to Ebony. Um, I think it's regarding the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, this past summer, um, specifically the use of cars as weapons, um, you know, and also the question around like automobile safety, particularly for black women. Um, you know, we've seen cases like Sandra Bland and black people being pulled over. So just talking about how that's developed in the policy. And I guess also like Ebony, I think one of the things that kind of keys into some of your work around 125th Street of Freedom is also this kind of connection between what Angie talked about single family dwelling and also this question on gentrification and like spatialization around that. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, but also this like, how did it feel to be in the street and with groups and like, how did the, the community react to it? But also, you know, did, it, did that produce a new form of safety in terms of artistic practices and thinking about how women move in the city, um, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, um, so what I what I feel called to share about this, I mean, there's a there's a lot in that question, Kazembe. Um, that you know, black folks in this in this country have a cultural practice of of protest, of parading, of um for of celebrating in, in public spaces and also um renouncing oppression and trauma in, in public spaces as well. And what I found last summer with the Black Lives Matter protests and with the, with the Black Lives Matter protests that have been happening really since the beginning of the founding of this country um, is, is that um, I found the, the protests to be a radical way of remembering. Um, remembering um, in terms of what happens in the body when you take up space in a way that has been done before for years and years before and how we're really activating a through line of, of, of liberation, of insistence on liberation by putting our black bodies in public spaces in protest or in celebration. And um, so while I personally did not find it necessary in 2020 to be out in the street for the, the, the series of Black Lives Matter protests that were happening, I was in the street in 2019 doing this work with 125th and Freedom in 2018 and 2017 and 2016. 
And so there is, you know, there, there is a through line, I think, um, of thinking about what happens when we, when we come together as communities. And I keep, I keep, as folks are, as we're going over the questions, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you know, mass mobilization, mass protests, um, grassroots organizing. This work has been over, like for, for, for generations, the work of um, moving around the margins to, to, to make space for people who are, who are sy systemically, systematically excluded um, has always been through a practice, a multi-pronged strategy of working, uh, maybe working along with government, but really what is happening at the grassroots? What is happening underneath the surface that doesn't, doesn't, um, that doesn't require going through state-sanctioned ways of supporting the needs that we have? Yes, the government should be doing a lot, but I think you know, it's it's increasingly and, and definitely through the process of being a public performance artist, I am learning the power of us being there. You know, the power of us being there. There's a moment within the work that I, I showed a clip from where we um, look at four corners of 125th and Malcolm X. So at the intersection of Malcolm X Boulevard and Martin Luther King Boulevard, we see a Whole Foods, we see a Starbucks, we see a, um, a, a banner that says, welcome to New Harlem, and it's a whole family of white folks. We see all of this mass capitalism around us. And in the midst of that, we hear the sounds of Black Harlem. And we hear that because of the folks who are walking on the street, of the cars and the music coming down, you know, the music and the cars coming down the street. We are there, we have a whole brass band with us. And it's this, this to me, you know, um, the question of, of, of safety and the question of, of what is happening to our home spaces and how we're able to move around, especially under the guise of, of gentrification. Um, I do believe, you know, that it is it is through collective action, collective organizing, and it's happening. There are folks right now who are organizing for housing justice in Harlem, in New York City, around this country. There are folks right now who are establishing mutual aid networks um, because of, you know, the, the current, like just last week, Texas had no electricity, parts of Texas, no electricity, no water because of a a snowstorm, you know, and parts of Mississippi, parts of the South that don't typically have these types of issues. And in the midst of asking, you know, in the midst of having these expectations from the government to do certain things, in the midst of that, we're also, I think, doubling and tripling down on what it is that we're doing at the grassroots. And I, I want to, if I don't get a chance to say anything else before we before we wrap up, I want to, I want to just say, you know, I want to say power to the people, power to the grassroots, power to the organizers with all of what's happening, you know, there is nothing that shifts without, without us, without us de determining that regardless of what those who think they have the power are doing, we are still honoring and moving and making a way from making a way, you know, to, to not just survive, but to thrive. Um, it's not easy. I'm not trying to give the government an easy out. Absolutely not. But I want, you know, I want my, my final words to be all power to the people. Um, and, and we can, we can make the change, you know, on, on the local level, um, regardless of what, the, the government decides to do. Um, we have to, we have to. Let, I'm, I'm really excited and interested to put energy to that. That's, that's what I walk out of every rehearsal, every opportunity to be in, in public performance space. I leave enlivened because I know that many people who've moved down those same corridors have made, made action and made change um, happen. 
Thank you, Ebony. I know here in Montreal, it's the only way any change can happen. Anyone else wanted to answer that one question? I'm putting some comments into um, the chat function that aren't questions that were posed just in the interests of time. And um, I'll move on because uh, I'm guessing we might need to wrap up soon, but uh, there's um, two questions from someone named anonymous attendee. Um, so um, maybe we'll just end with um, one of these questions. Uh, what are examples of specific projects in mobility and transport that are just empowering? Maybe just very quickly, if anyone has a response, and then we could wrap up. Yeah. Okay, if, uh, if, if you want me to, to um, take the first answer here, um, I think uh, there, there are several, as I mentioned in, in my uh, presentation, uh, there are some examples uh, where uh, the, the, the different types of barriers are tackled. Uh, for example, the, the accessibility, uh, accessibility barriers, there are several best practices uh, to, to, to make it, but that's not just the, that's not necessarily empowering. Uh, empowering is, is really more on the, the uh, aspect of um, raising the, uh, or in, improving, increasing the ability uh, to use uh, specific modes of transport. Uh, and that's not just uh, the use of the, the vehicles themselves, uh, it's also an issue of digitalization, for example, because um, uh, digital information services, for example, uh, are not necessarily uh, being able to be used by, by everybody. Uh, so we have a dig digital uh, gap also uh, that we are facing and we need to make sure also that uh, there are digital competences um, for, for all people uh, to, to use different information services, for example, and then to understand uh, how to use uh, a service, um, especially when it comes to, uh, to those who, who really fill the gaps, uh, which, which could be also a private transport provider, uh, but usually they, they use uh, apps um, for, for booking their services, and that's uh, also then narrowing down uh, the, the group of people who are actually able to use it and uh, sharing, car sharing uh, providers, for example, has, uh, they know that their services are very rarely used by, by women. So most of their customers are male. Uh, and that's probably the issue, uh, at least that's, that's the hypothesis, that um, women um, have, have more issues with booking, the, the booking systems, for example. Um, and uh, they're also, they're also uh, on the emotional uh, level, uh, as I mentioned, um, empowering people to, to use uh, a mode of transport where they feel uh, uncertain, insecure, unsafe uh, is, uh, is, is very difficult, as I mentioned. And uh, just the, the one example that I gave, gave and, and somebody posted a link uh, also as well, uh, for identifying a group that has no access to a specific mode of transport like migrant women to, to uh, cycling. Uh, and they are not allowed to use public transport uh, on their own, for example. They need a male uh, um, a relative to accompany them. Uh, but they can use uh, bicycles uh, because they, they, are, they are not among other, others there and they can use them alone. Uh, so that was an initiative empowering them also to to use this mode of uh, this mode of transport to get around and to have more freedom. Then, so uh, I think it's it's really very important to uh, identify the barriers uh, when it comes to why 
uh, inequalities are evolving and who is affected, which different groups are affected. And if you identify these barriers, we can then develop also the measures to overcome the barriers. And I think there's a lot to be done uh, on, the, on the ability and on the, the ambition side um, to, to make sure that uh, everybody also has the same uh, choices and the same uh, amount of, uh, of, of modes to choose from and not be limited to just a small part of it. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, I think we are running out of time. So um, I think we may need to, to wrap up now. But uh, Neon, you, you're unmuted. And I didn't know if you had a final point or. OK. Um, I just wanted to mention um, Sim, that... eu queria rapidamente. Bem rápido. Yes, quickly. 